drag racing fan, this is the Monday Morning Racer, and we're going to take a look in review at the 60th Winter Nationals in Pomona, California at the Fairplex. That's next, here on Monday Morning Racer. <laughs> NHRA Drag Racing is back, and as you know, it kicks off at the Winter Nationals in Pomona, California. This year it was the 60th anniversary of that event. And I want to say first and foremost about Pomona itself, in regard to the facilities, in regard to the fan experience, I do hope in the future to be able to bring you all fan tips for whatever national event that you may go to to help you know where to eat, uh, where to go, what are the facilities like. Pomona is a storied event, obviously. It's been around for 60 plus years, this Winter National event, its 60th annual event. A lot of great moments in drag racing have happened at Pomona, whether it was kicking off the year or at the finals in the event that they have as the last race of the year. With that being stated though, I think Pomona and the facilities themselves, fans need to know that this is not any longer really a top-notch facility, at least to you, the average fan. What do I mean by that? Well first, the layout of the facility for you as a fan, especially for you as a fan if you have purchased a general admission ticket, no matter what day it is, in fact they're not even recognized on Thursday in the normal place in which you sit Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, but to get to the general admission seats, you have to go through the staging lanes. Oh, by the way, if you happen to be drinking a beer and you want to go to the general admission, well, you can't take that beer through the staging lanes to your general admission seats, which has no alcohol cells on that side. So if you want to drink at the race, enjoy a beverage, you're going to have to do that before you ever go to your general admission seats. So literally, you have the beer gang, right there at the staging lanes crossing walk, guzzling down their beer before they cross over. After crossing over for those general mission seats, also some reserve seats, depending on the day, you go through another bag check. So you got a bag check when you initially go in, you have another bag check just to get to your general admission seats. So you get hit for buying cheaper seats, honestly. I understand that they are there to check people who are actually trying to go to the tower, but if I got my general admission ticket, I obviously came in through one bag check. Why do you have to check my bags again? It's very strange. And for someone like me, I'm carrying camera gear. If I go to that side of the track and I'm looking for a shot from the stands, I'm having to unload a book bag. I'm unloading my camera bag. I'm having to unload the two tripods I'm carrying. It's a hassle, especially when you've already been through one bag check when you purchased your ticket at the main gate. So there's that oddity. Not only that, the bathrooms are a bit dated. This also occurred to me while I was at the Winter Nationals. Got there early on Sunday. I'll talk to you in a few moments of why you need to get there early. But I get there early, I go look for a restroom, and the restroom that I'm familiar with at the Winter Nationals, guess what? Even though there were fans there on the lot, even though teams had already got there, even though the Racers for Christ Chapel service was started up already, it was locked, and you had to walk down the strip to find the other bathroom that was unlocked. I found that strange that you have this facility that I think should be unlocked. You should be able to go use it, and yet everybody at that time was funneled to this other restroom, and yes, there was a line, even though there was another restroom that could have been used as long as it was unlocked. Security. Security, I found at Pomona, or I have found at Pomona, they are nice, they are cordial, but you better expect this to be 
a strict group of security. They are not lax at all, in my opinion, on how they conduct themselves. They are strict. If you're trying to get to some restricted areas to get a little bit more of the NHRA experience, you're going to get hit if you don't have the right credentials. It is not a track to try to push the envelope. Again, let me remind you that if you even have alcohol and you want to go to the other side of the track into where general mission is for like Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, they're not letting you go through the staging lanes and you cannot enjoy your beverage sitting down to where you purchased your tickets. Let's talk about parking. Parking, honestly, is, unless you get there early, atrocious. If you get there early, I highly recommend, and if you're going just one day, let's say Sunday, get there early and buy pit side parking. It's going to cost you 30 bucks, but it's worth it. It gets you closer to the main entrance. You're a lot closer to the track once it's time to go. Mind you, you're not going to get out of the track any quicker being pit side. They don't really let you out that well. Again, it's 30 bucks to park pit side. It's $15 for general admission. Look, I understand this is a site that is used for many other things, being the Fairplex. But $15 for general admission parking is pretty steep. The only other place I know that comes close through the NHRA tour, please chime in in the comments below of the prices elsewhere, would be at Lucas Oil Raceway. It's $10 to park for the U.S. Nationals, at least on Monday. So though Pomona is a storied event, you have facilities that are rather dated, parking is atrocious, it's a long walk, and if you don't get there early, be prepared to be frustrated and, I think, overcharged. Also, be prepared for security to be a bit strict, nonetheless polite and helpful. If you're going to Pomona, frankly, and you can find another track to enjoy NHRA drag racing, I would recommend going to another track. I appreciate the history at Pomona, but it is relying on a lot of prestige at the moment, and somebody really needs to take the time and invest in that facility once again and make it a premier facility, especially being a facility in which you have the kickoff to the season and the conclusion of the season. Let me give you another example. There's a lot of raceways in which you go to, they have a tram service for you in general admission parking to make the walk a little less arduous, to get you there a little bit quicker, to get you there with a little bit less wear and tear on your feet. Well, there is no tram service at Pomona. The only tram service there is, is to get you to the NHRA Museum, which is free, by the way, if you do purchase a ticket and go to Pomona and enjoy the races. And let me say this, for everything that you're going to pay in parking, for everything you're going to pay in your ticket prices, which Pomona has a very steep ticket price, for everything that you're going to pay in food prices, you need to work it into your schedule while at Pomona and go to the NHRA Museum to get a bang for your buck, honestly. So, when you go to Pomona next time, make sure, bring plenty of cash, definitely get pit side parking if you're going Sunday, go early, tailgate, enjoy yourself, hang out even after the race, let people go home, and realize that it's not a premier facility. It's got some age to it. Speaking of facility, Pomona has one of the shortest shutdown areas through the entire NHRA tour. In fact, it may have the shortest. And you don't have anywhere else to run off to if you go through the sand and the net, you're in the road and on into the park that sits below the drag strip. So the facilities, again, rather dated, not that fan friendly in my opinion. They're really not racer friendly 
either with the short shutdown area. And that brings up a safety point that I definitely want to talk about. I think it's time for the NHRA to take a serious look at possibly changing what is in the shutdown area, especially concerning the net. Take a look at this footage. Great side-by-side -side start. Dan Horan's got a big speed car. Check it out. 565, 262, but no parachute from what I could tell up here in the timing tower. And he is in the sand at the top end of the racetrack. I mean, two great side-by-side -side runs, 565. I think the speed record is 265. He ran 262. And right at this point, Dan knew he was in trouble. Trying to, trying to get on the brakes here. The car bounces a bit. And it bounces out the parachute, but at this point it's too late. See the uh, sand trap doing its thing, slowing the car down into the net, and it, I believe it just flipped it right over. Wow. You know, honestly, uh, the car had slowed down quite a bit. I would say the sand trap did its job. The good news is Dan Horan is fine. He's no worse for the wear. The car was damaged, but he's already got it back on the jig, and he's getting it ready so he can be back out for March meet in that Nostalgia Funny Car that I've seen through social media channels. With the footage, though, I think you can clearly see an issue. Dan was basically trapped. The normal way of exiting a funny car through the hatch, he wasn't able to do that. It was completely closed, sitting in the sand. And the NHRA does have in its history a couple of fatalities at least due to the striking of the net. And I definitely think it's time for the NHRA. My thoughts are this. What about an angled net to create more of a glancing blow and catching the car instead of this stop and throwing it back? What about two nets angling to a point creating almost like a catcher's mitt to some extent for the race car? I'm not the only one out there thinking that they should really be looking at uh, some different ways to stop these cars in this case. There was a crew member on Justin Ashley's top fueler wrenching on the machine that weekend. He had said that he took some sand time there even at Pomona himself in an alcohol funny car and that he's had some thoughts on how to get these cars stopped in the case of no shoots or a serious accident beyond the net and beyond even just the sand. I definitely think it's time for the NHRA to take a look at that because worst case scenario, what if Dan was trapped and the car was on fire? I don't want to think about that. I don't want to think about the burns that he would have occurred and also him possibly breathing for a long extended period of time in that situation. I'm glad Dan's okay. But I seriously think at this point, the NHRA's got to take a look and say, can we do anything better? And maybe there's not. Maybe this is the safest way to do it. And there's other things maybe that need to be tried and implemented even before the sand and before the net. But I definitely think it's time with the history, the speed of the cars, with that short of a shutdown area concerning Pomona, how do we stop these cars better for the drivers that's more safe and where they wouldn't be trapped in a situation like Dan was. So there was a lot of buzz around this 60th annual Winter Nationals in the pits. First and foremost, though, I honestly don't think it should be probably the most important story. I want to highlight some other ones in a few moments, but Steve Torrance, those Capco boys not being in the pits for the Winter Nationals was a story that definitely had buzz throughout the pits. A lot of the teams were talking about the effect of the Capco boys not being there. Talking about the opportunity presented to them with that team not being there. There was even one retired top fuel driver got the eavesdrop on him and he was speaking about the situation with the Torrance family. 
it basically boils down to the appeal and the fine. There are some other things that people like to throw in, like tires slashed and things of that nature. Nonetheless, my concern with mentioning it is the impact that it had on other teams. You had other Nitro teams not show up because Steve, possibly you know, Billy as well, the Capco boys did not show up. So you have Scott Palmer, you have Jeff Deal, you have others. I have seen at other national events in other sections of the country, they rely on the Capco racing team, smaller teams, independent teams, for some parts and pieces and servicing through a national event weekend. So when you have one of these larger teams, well-funded teams, not show up, it's going to have a nitro ripple effect through the pits, and we saw that in Pomona. I will say this, it was funny, there was at least one creative fan, if not a group, they were handing out pacifiers with a note for Steve Torrance about him not being on the grounds, and I, in fact, was wearing, and you've probably seen me wear, a Torrance hoodie. I got that hoodie back at Maple Grove, the weather turned a little cool, I didn't have a hoodie, so I purchased the cheapest hoodie that I could find at an NHRA national event. Oh, by the way, an NHRA hoodie off of a main gate trailer, yeah, $65. So yes, I went with the $40 Torrance hoodie, and it was funny, I'm thankful that Terry Haddock and uh, Cameron Foray, they were very gracious. I was over there filming and I was filming while wearing my Steve Torrance hoodie. They were very gracious. They did not tar and feather me that day. I eventually got another hoodie and was good for the rest of the weekend, but there was a lot of buzz and people were chiming in on Torrance as a crybaby and Torrance as a punk or, or whatever that you want to throw in there. I'm more concerned about the effect it had in the Nitro Pits. Folks, at least four cars didn't show up at my count because Steve Torrance and the Capco boys did not show. That's significant. The entry list was only 13, 14 cars if I remember correctly. That's a significant amount. And if that continues to happen through the year, that's going to seriously affect the card of an NHRA national event for you and I as fans. With that being said, though I did not see the national broadcast, I was there in the pits and wasn't able to see it on TV, it gives the NHRA an opportunity, and I hope they did take the opportunity, that with Steve Torrance not being there, with there being a smaller field, they can highlight the regional teams that run places like Pomona, Phoenix, Las Vegas, but they don't go to the East Coast. For example, Moroni. I hope that they put some time and invested some time in sharing Maroney's story of running Pomona, running Phoenix, running Las Vegas, being a West Coast only type of guy in Top Fuel, not running the full tour. I think you have opportunity with those teams not showing up to elevate, to put the focus, the limelight on other teams and give fresh new stories instead of highlighting an absence. Share the absence share the points, but then go talk to the people that are there and why they are there and why they are competing. You never know. By doing that, they might become teams that run the full schedule, especially if they're able to perform under those circumstances. of entry lists, yes, the top fuel count being so low seemed to be the big buzz, seemed to dominate the headlines, but when I walked through the pro stock pits and when you looked at the entry list for pro stock, I think it was rather encouraging for the first race of the 50th anniversary of pro stock there at the 60th Winter Nationals. On the entry list, there were at one time 20 pro stock cars entered for Pomona. And 
Of that 20, yes, I know, you're probably already typing away in the comments section. Pro stock is born. Pro stock is pro Camaro. Pro stock this, pro stock that. Look, the class has got its issues. I have a whole video on that of things I would like to see changed. No, I don't think it's as simple as pro mod is the future. But at Pomona, yes, you had a ton of Camaros, but you also had two Dodge Darts and you had two Mustangs. I know the Mustangs are not Ford powered, but even Fernando Quadra himself, he mentioned that you just cannot create the power in a Ford engine right now that you can with the Chevrolet engines for whatever reason. So I want to highlight something. I don't know whether the NHRA did or not, but you had 20 Pro Stock cars entered and attempting to qualify for the 60th Winter Nationals. That's good news for Pro Stock in this 50th year. Monday morning race here in the pits at the Winter Nationals. Pomona, California at the Fairplex caught up with Fernando Quadra. And he is in one good looking hot rod this weekend in Pro Stock. Fernando, look, tell me, what is the make, model, year on this great machine and why are you in it? Yeah, well, my ride is a 2019 Mustang, a GT version style. And well, I am a Ford fan since I was in my first car when I was 16. My dad bought me a 1995 Mustang, and since then I fell in love with the with the brand. Then I got to buy, to buy a 2014 model. Since then I thought rather if I go, I'm going to start racing Pro Stock, I'd rather do it in a Mustang. So that's the main reason. Definitely, man. Look, Ford fans, and I'm a Ford guy myself. We have been wanting to see the blue oval represented again in Pro Stock, so it's good to see a Mustang in the field. So thank y'all for carrying the banner. Now, speaking of the family banner, yeah, y'all are in drag racing, but you've got this boot company. So how does it go from the boot company to drag racing, and what kind of boots do y'all make? Uh, well, the company is called Corral Boots. It's, we sell them here in the States, manufacturing in Mexico, and the main reason we, my dad started the business back in the 90s, was to actually get to pay for the racing. And he, he, the only thing that he knew how to do was to make boots. So he started doing, the business got well. Then he said, okay, let's start racing in the States, and boom. So that's how we got to it. There it is. So look, if you're needing a pair of Western boots, you need to check out Corral. I need some new ones myself. Yes, so course. here we go, man. We're in Southern California. You're from Mexico. Okay. You gotta tell me, which is it? Is it tacos, burritos, or fajitas? What do you want to order? <laughs> oh, it's tacos. Tacos is my favorite meal. Tacos? Yes. Nothing like Taco Tuesday? Yeah, no, nothing like it. <laughs> awesome. Well, man, look, we hope you have a great 2020, and when the sky's the limit, and we hope you take this, motor, this Mustang for a full mile all the way to the Winter Circle. Thank you very much. I hope it's going to be a great season for us. Thank you, Fernando. The last buzz item that I want to talk about in the pits of Pomona had to deal with the changes to the NHRA countdown. And the buzz was negative. The, be the buzz was one of frustration. The buzz was one of perplexity. Why? And I get that. As a fan, I don't understand why the NHRA has made the changes that they have made. Look, I get it. If you've ran all the races and you have qualified, sure, I can understand you wanting to be in the countdown, but the countdown should be comprised of people who have, on performance, made it in. I can understand people saying that this is a participation trophy handout. I'm not going to go so far to agree with that because these people are still competing. They're still making passes. They are still going out there and attempting to go rounds. And I'm sure many of them will. But nonetheless, you now can make the countdown by doing your qualifying runs, even going out first round, just put it in the beams, and yet just show up to all the races and do that and you can make the countdown. I think it takes away from the prestige of making the top 10 and going from Indy on in the countdown with that points reset. So a lot of drivers have thrown their opinion into the ring. They've expressed frustration. Some that just run a partial schedule because their regional teams have also expressed that, well, it doesn't incentivize anything any further. Others with smaller programs have stated, look, we're going to do what we can do. It doesn't help us go out there and actually try to make more races. We want to get in on performance. That's what seemed to be the buzz. No matter that this is now an option, people want to get in on performance. 
And whether you show up to all the races or not, those that perform the best, I think they should be in the countdown. Now remember, it's been proven that you can not show up to all the races and make the countdown. Billy Torrance, Mike Salinas, but oh, by the way, don't forget Leah Pruitt. She did not race in Epping last year, but she did make the countdown. And you did have other teams that ran every race and ran every round, and yet they didn't make the countdown. They didn't have the performance Therefore, I don't think they should be in the show. And by the way, they didn't perform any better during the countdown time frame. The countdown should be for those that make it in on performance and performance alone. Monday morning racer in the Pro Stock Pits caught up with Bo Butner. Bo knows racing. Man, look, give us a rundown so far of this 60th annual NHRA Winter Nationals for you, where you're at, what you're looking for going into Sunday. First things first, have an awesome new sponsorship, uh, Strut Masters. Uh, Chip called up and uh, gave us a good opportunity, so we're real happy with that deal, and plus we're running good, so maybe that's why he picked us out, who knows. But uh, no, we had a, had a good two days of qualifying, we ended up fifth. Uh, I kind of like where I'm at on the ladder. It's never a given in pro stock, as you're talking a thousand a mile. So uh, do our job tomorrow on the starting line and make clean runs. And I won this race the last two years in a row, so we'll see if we can do it. Make it three. Awesome. You mentioned running well and running well last year, and you ran well the entire year, but you were out ahead on folks. The quirky countdown clamped down on you, and I'm curious your thoughts with the changes to the countdown, and also I want to throw this in. Ron Caps, fellow competitor but in Funny Car, he advocated that winners should get bonus points. Would you like to see something like that in the countdown system? I would like to, or I mean, it works two ways. The year I won the championship, I started out way ahead, started in first, and ended up in first. Uh, the very next year, I'm down there in eighth, maybe ninth, I think, to start the year. So I was happy to restart the points. So it works both ways. I think it's pretty neat. Uh, I'd almost like to see, and I don't know how this would work, but you have to maybe win a, an event during the year to be part of the countdown. I think that would be pretty neat, and, and, and no provisionals, nothing like that. Just Let's just do a year like that and see what happens, but who knows. They think they've got it figured out, and of course it's their playground and we do what they tell us. All right, so Strut Masters on board, brand new year. I know you're looking forward to it, but we're in Southern California, and I want to ask, what do you look forward to the most? Burritos, tacos, or fajitas? Which one are you choosing? We like tacos. We like Del Taco. It's funny. Uh, I have a place in Florida, and there's like one or two in Orlando, but there's none of that stuff where we're from. So uh, uh, Randy Lynn loves Del Taco, so we're, we're a taco kind of, kind of family. Awesome. Well, folks, Bo knows he loves tacos. Bo that's, Butner, thank you right. for your time. Thanks. Appreciate it. Drag racing fan, I hope you've enjoyed this review by myself, Lee Craft, the Monday morning racer concerning the 60th Winter Nationals in Pomona, California. Look, congratulations to Jack Beckman, picked up right where they left off. Not only him, but Jeg Coughlin as well. And hey, Jeg, I hope you have a great farewell tour here in 2020 with many more wins. Also, congratulations to Doug Coletta. How many Winter Nationals can you win? That man is on a roll in that event, and I hope Doug picks up the championship this year, honestly. Look, in the future, I do plan on looking at points, but right now, well, with the countdown changes after one event, and it being the NHRA. The show where everything's made up and the points don't matter. <laughs> uh... No, I'm joking. The points do matter. And the rules are there for reasons. Nonetheless, we're going to give a little bit of time, possibly into Phoenix, and talk about the points. Look, make sure you're following on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. You'll see a lot of photos and videos there as well. Monday Morning Racer from NHRA National Events. A big thank you to Chip Lofton and Strutmasters.com for making it possible for Monday Morning Racer to be out at the national events for the NHRA. I am looking forward to a lot more here on the channel, so please hit the subscribe button, give this video a thumbs up, chat in the comments below. I look forward to hearing from you and enjoy the remaining footage. Take care and God bless.
Monday morning racer in the Pro Stock pits, caught up with three time, three time, three time <laughs> Pro Stock NHRA champion Erica Enders. Erica, well, tell me about that championship run, pulling it off there in 2019. It was awesome. I mean, to say the least, uh, of course, it's a huge blessing to win the championship. It was our third, yes, but it had been such a long time since we had any success uh, since our back-to-back -back championships in 2014-2015. And I don't feel like one beats more than the other, but I think this one might just a little bit because of the valleys that we had to crawl through to get back to, to being in championship form. And, you know, having said that, we only won two races last year. We're fortunate enough to have it happen in the countdown and, and secure the championship. But it wasn't a stellar season, so I'm ready to uh, to take a take a shot at this season. Sure, I bet y'all really feel 2019 was almost a redemption season yeah. for how long it had taken to get back to being a dominant, you know, individual on and off the track with NHRA Pro Stock Drag Racing. So, hey, glad you got the three. Thank Definitely, you. you're ranking up there in the female drag racers and. You know, you knocked on Shirley's door, so it's pretty cool. Very cool. All right, so looking at this year, obviously you said some more wins. Uh, you've got this program's heading back in the right direction. There's a big event coming up, though, called yes. the Door Slammer Nationals. Your boss got a big part in it with Wes Buck. Look, what would it mean to win the first ever Door Slammer Nationals? That'd probably be as cool, if not cooler, than, than winning a national event. Um, I mean, what we've done, and by we, I mean Wes and Richard, and, and everyone here at Elite has had a little hand in it, but Wes, Richard, Ozzy, the guy that owns uh, Orlando, it was, uh, it was a lot of hard work and effort that went into this, and we started off with a $50,000 purse for each class, Pro Stock and Pro Mod. Well, since we announced the race at PRI, we've gone to work on raising more money behind the scenes. All of our vendors that we do business with have, in turn, helped out with this race to raise the pods. I think we're going to pay Pro Stock 200 and Pro Mod 100. So, and we've loaded it up at the bottom, paying a significant amount to qualify to get a bunch of cars to come out there. And I think it's going to be an awesome event. It's, it, again, taking a lot of hard work and hats off to Wes, to Wes and Richard. Definitely. Central Florida is going to be jumping that weekend. <laughs> definitely. Sure. With the Door Slammer Nationals. Now, you, you, where you're at in drag racing, you get an opportunity to race many places, even around the world. Recently, in the off season, though there's not much of an off season, you were in Saudi Arabia. You had an interesting moment where there was some bit of segregation for you as ladies. I'm curious, when you as a female racer that has done so well and accomplished so much, you go to a country like that, do you feel that you are breaking some barriers down and allowing people to be empowered? Well, it's an interesting position to be in. It's kind of a fine line to walk, I guess. It's I've been to the Middle East before. I've been to Kuwait and Iraq and Afghanistan, but with our military. So this was a, a different trip as a civilian. And I have to be honest, a little nerve-wracking with what's going on in the world in this day and age. But um, I couldn't... I couldn't speak higher of the kingdom. Like we, we had a great time. They were everyone was so welcoming. I didn't have to wear a hijab or anything because I'm from America. Whereas a couple years prior, I would have had to. So um, things are things are coming along. Like women over there just got the right to drive in 2018. So it, it's hard for us over here to fathom that. But it's it's a different culture. It's a different world over there. But having said that, they were super respectful of me. I was nervous because you're not supposed to shake hands or make eye contact and that's kind of like you know my saying hey America how you doing but um, really really nice people really beautiful place uh, we went to downtown Riyadh and, and kind of did some touristy stuff but they've just opened the kingdom for tourism so that's kind of what what spurred this trip over there in the global auto salon so we had a great time but yes um, I want to tell a small little uh, a story about a girl that I met over there her name was Ezra and she is she just graduated college she went to she came to America to study and all she's ever wanted to do is drive like she was so thrilled when they were allowed to drive so she got a, she acquired her driver's license over here in the states she was going to school in Virginia and she got a car and she drove clear across the country and spent two days in every state and trying to find racetracks all over that's what this girl did she wants to be a race car driver so 
just try to grasp the concept. Like she just got the right to drive in 2018 and now she's licensing in a, in a top dragster over there. So it's mind blowing. It's really awesome. And just to get to spend some time with her and hear her stories of the, the things that she had to go through to get to where she is. And then she was interested in hearing my story to get to where I am. And it was just, it was really kind of humbling. It was really an awesome experience. So cool, cool, cool opportunity. And I'm thankful for it because it puts a lot of things in perspective. Ezra, wherever you're at, that is totally <laughs> awesome. She's awesome. Ender, Erica, thank you for sharing that. All right, so my last question for you. Yes, champion. Yes, Door Slammer Nationals company coming up, traveling the world. The off season. What is the funnest thing you did in the off season? I guess it would have been Saudi. I mean, I I left straight from the banquet from the World Championship on Tuesday morning from LA and flew to Saudi. We spent a week there. I flew home the day the day before Thanksgiving. So then it's Thanksgiving. It took a couple of days to go deer hunting. So other than that, all I've done is work uh, at the shop, trying to sell trucks and trailers for my boss, trying to raise money for this program, and testing. So I've really not had like a lot of fun, fun time, but I've had a lot of great opportunities and, and a blast doing it. So I'm awesome. Thankful. Well, folks, excuse the nitro breaks yeah. during the interview. <laughs> That's been Erica Ender's three-time NHRA Pro Stock Champion. Erica, thank you. Thanks, guys.